All right, so the first question is, what is your name? My name is Lucy Cooper. All right, well, thank you for being with us today. We're going to chat a little bit about uh, your background, your experience at Madison, and then we'll wrap up talking about the class a little bit. Yep. Uh, so where are you from? Well, I'm originally from Winston-Salem, North Carolina, and I came out to Madison in 1964. I graduated from one of those Southern Girls prep schools in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, graduating class of 32 girls, and came to the great big University of Wisconsin, um, propelled by my high school principal who thought that I would enjoy the history department. She had been a history major herself at Temple University and saw how much I, I really enjoyed the history classes at, at um, Salem while I was ignoring a number of other things that I was supposed to be doing. And I didn't know anybody, and it was probably the biggest single shock of my life. Um, but after six weeks, you couldn't have pried me loose. Okay. Um. That's interesting. So you said that the teacher was a UW Madison? No, Temple no, no Temple. She had been a Temple graduate in Pennsylvania. I don't know how she got into education and how she got into girls' education, but I was lucky for me she did. But she knew about the history department in Madison. Oh, yes. Fascinating. Yeah, well, the history department in Madison was pretty famous. Oh, yeah. It was, it was the, the wild Midwesterners and, and the progressive thing. She thought I was a radical. I was not a radical when I came to Madison. I was um, a Lyndon Johnson liberal. Okay. So. Did you major in history? I did. Okay. And uh, so did you take courses with Professor Moss? I did. Which courses? Um, I'm trying to remember. I know I took the introduction to European history. That's the one I remember the most. And I was in that class with my good friend Peter Abbott. I met Peter in in integrated liberal studies. I don't know if they still have it, but it was a special program and it's, it's, I just met some wonderful people there. But Mossy didn't teach in ILS. I took one of his big lecture courses. And um, later I began, but dropped out of a seminar um, when I was a, either a junior or a senior. But, but by then what I was really majoring in is ending the war in Vietnam. So uh, I was, um, telling John earlier that the last two years I don't think I really did academics um, and I realized I wasn't going to do justice to the Masi seminar and I shouldn't be taking up a space because it wasn't you, know, you can hide in a big lecture course um, you can't hide in a seminar sure. how did you get involved with the student movement well if you had the slightest interest in politics you could not be involved and in 1964, the big emphasis was on civil rights, and I felt pretty strongly about that. In fact, one of the reasons I had come out to the Midwest is I knew I would embarrass my parents if I stayed in North Carolina because my, my father was a rock-ribbed segregationist and would have been mortified if his little girl had been in demonstrations right under his nose. So. Um, it then shifted, and I believe, I'm, I'm trying to keep this straight, in the spring of 1965, um, after Tonkin Gulf, um, the anti-war movement began to gather steam, and um, it fit right in with the history department in Madison, because you remember William Appleman Williams? Yeah, they'd always been anti-interventionist and very suspicious of America becoming a new empire. and. So there were a number of young graduate students who had been attracted by the, the spirit of Wisconsin. Mossy writes a lot about that in his autobiography, which is a wonderful book. I'm so glad you put me on to that. That was great. So that, that's how I got involved. One thing led to another. Um, and what, what was the organization? The Committee to End the War in Vietnam. It wasn't specifically SDS, although SDS people were involved in it. And um, I just went to the meetings and wrote things and went to the demonstrations and it was taking up more and more and more of my time. And by, by my junior year, I did enough, enough to pass my courses. I mean, I never flunk, flunked a course. I dropped a lot of courses, but but I wasn't, that was not my focus. My focus on this is the most important thing happening in the world. We have to do something. Do you think that your interest 
or how did your interest in history influence your your involvement then with, with the committee to end the war in Vietnam and with civil rights movement? Well, my interest in history was an interest in figuring out how we got to where we were. I was always interested in politics. My parents, even though I said my father was a rock rib segregationist, they were also Southern New Deal liberals. So we, we would watch the news at dinner, because dinner time came when Huntley Brinkley were on. I don't know if you remember them. That was the big NBC news show in the 60s. Um, and we would watch it. We would talk politics. Um, and we frequently disagreed. So I figured learning history would give me an idea of how we got there. But the other reason is I love stories. I just love stories. Um, I think that's why I was so happy in law school. I viewed reading all those cases as figuring out the stories, um, particularly the family law and probate cases. But that's another story. Well, let's talk a little bit about that, because how do you think the, your history uh, your, your time studying history at Madison and in the Integrated Liberal Studies program influenced your career trajectory? Um, there weren't many jobs for history graduates. <laughs> <laughs> what, it was really more the anti-war movement um, because every time we would try to do something or say something, people would say, well, you can't do that because the law, blah, blah, blah. Um, the civics of it, the politics, and kept running up to, well, if you want to know what's going on, particularly on the free speech issues. I don't know if you know this, but Madison had a major free speech case. Um, Madison had rules very much like the University of California about student organizations um, taking part in politics on campus. And after the Dow demonstration and a bunch of people were arrested, um, I think the university was trying to enforce some of those rules and William Kunstler came out and brought a, a civil rights action in federal court. And so it occurred to me that this is where the action was. And Wisconsin had a good law school and I got into it. Yeah. And, and it, was, it was a good choice. Good choice. That, but in the background was always putting things in context. I mean, what history does is help you to put things in context, whether that context is happy or unhappy. Absolutely. And frankly, Professor Mossy probably influenced me more. You know, I was, I took Goldberg too. I was in the Mossy Goldberg group. And um, Professor Mossy's outlook really did influence me. The way that he lectured or the way that he understood sort of? That he was a pessimist. He was a pessimist who kept fighting. Um, but he didn't have some of the illusions about the um, brotherhood of man. They call it the brotherhood of man then. Um, overcoming evil and that we're all going to go off and be happy socialists together and defeat nationalism and racism if we can just have the people understand. He didn't believe that. He didn't believe that for one minute. Um, he always said he was an optimistic pessimist. Mm -hmm, I think that's right. That he believed yep. in human potential. But right. He understood that humans didn't learn much from history. It was not, you know, he was and that there are and that there are certain stubborn characteristics that keep repeating and have to be confronted. Mm -hmm. That's why I liked his book, Confronting History. I like the title. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, let's talk a little bit about, about the class. How did you find out about it? Kathy. Really? Kathy Kendrigan um, got herself on the list for LNS to get the newsletters and to find out what's being offered. And she's the one that spotted it and um, stuck it under Peter's nose and said, you need to do this. Lucy probably needs to do it too. So we're all, we're good buddies. And I didn't know Kathy at the University of Wisconsin. We got to be friends later at Legal Action of Wisconsin. But she had been there at the same time. She'd been in the demonstrations too. And, um, and then she and Peter got together. Okay, that's great. Yeah. And now I'm on the list, so I get, get um, news of other courses. Great. Yeah, they have a number of interesting classes coming up this, this year. Celtic Traditions is what Kathy and I are in now. Oh, great. 
Peter passed on that one. He says 30 minutes of Irish music and he gets bored. <laughs> <laughs> One thing about um, <clears throat> your time in Madison, obviously, was very influential in shaping your life. Yes. Your, your post UW life. Right. What is the the main takeaway that you would um, emphasize in the uh, influence that Mossy that UW had on? Oh, you're going to get me emotional, and I'm going to cry in front of the camera. <laughs> no. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> no, it's not okay. <laughs> Um, it was so wonderful to be involved and to think you could make a difference. I'm not sure kids today have that. Um, and I hadn't realized until I read Professor Massey's autobiography how much he was involved politically behind the scenes. He kept that out of his lectures. He really did, and I really respect that. You, you could be a rock rib conservative and still learn from Professor Massey. And I'm not sure that that was as true of some of the others who let the um, emotion of the moment get into their classes. I mean, he really was a wonderful professional. Yeah. I think but, it was important for him to maintain that distinction. Mm -hmm. The classroom was a place for lots of different perspectives and through which he could maybe better understand the past. But what he, the politics was, that's the personal, that's, that's outside. Mm -hmm. that's, that's different than the methodologies of understanding the past. And right. also the ethical, moral basis of the study. Yeah, I think that was very evident in his work. I do too, and that politics or thinking the right things are not a shortcut. You can't take a shortcut from doing the research and doing the reading. That, that you have to take it seriously. And I think put things in, in, um, in their place in time. So. Yeah. Well, Bill, I think, has, has a good point here. I'll talk a little bit about um, sort of this, the Milwaukee group and how you guys came to meet in the forums. And, oh! Uh, just, we're just curious about, about that process. You knew Peter beforehand. Yes, Peter, Peter's been my friend since we were 19. Kathy's been my friend since we were in our 30s when we met up. And so, the three of us just jumped into it. And then we started reading the comments and realized, and, and I think I'm the one that said, read this Rusty Borkin fellow. He, he's one of us, I can tell, he's one of us. Because <laughs> you know, you just have a name attached to a comment and you don't really know anything else, but he's one of us. So Peter and Rusty, I think, connected. And then Rusty, um, Rusty and I would, you know, right back and forth through the forum. And then I thought, you know, at the end of this, we really should get together. Peter pulled in his brother-in-law, um, who is a Holocaust survivor himself, Jim Wegman. Jim was not, Jim didn't sign up formally to take the course. And then I pulled in a friend of mine who has spent, he's um, first generation American. His, his father came over from Germany in, I think, in the 1920s and his mother was Austrian and has spent a lifetime in um, progressive, even ra radical politics and um, has taken up the cause of, you know, Holocaust must never happen again. I mean, it's, that's Art Heitzer. Now, I don't think Art, Art signed up for the course. Yeah, Art actually signed up for the course. He didn't turn in all the writings, he, the assignments, but he signed up for it. And so that was, that was our Milwaukee group, and then Kathy, and then um, Sandy, Art's wife, is my former law partner, Sandy Edland. And so she would come, she never signed up for the course, but she would come and add her perspective. Um, and so that, that's how we got together. And then after the course ended, I thought, well, this, this is weird. We've been seeing this man on TV for, for months. Let's get together. And so that's when we set up the dinner and then I just had a feeling Rusty would know something about this um, this woman in Milwaukee who's working on um, neighborhood development from the neighborhood up, that you don't have to find always a, a rich person to come in and do it, that there are ways of getting 
capital formation from neighbors. And so I, I wanted to call her, and I figured Rusty would know how to get to her. And he did. So, so this creation of community here in Milwaukee enhanced your learning experience. Oh, yeah. And will continue. I assume that you now have this, this community here of, of uh, interest. You know, we had a small discussion group here that met at Peter's house and at Sandy's house. So we would, we would get together um, independent of, of being on our computers. And how did that, how did that in-person aspect, how did that start? Um, I don't remember. I think it was probably Peter or Kathy's idea. And Rusty didn't come to those. That was, that was just the old friends. I mean, you have to, we've been friends for 40 years. Um, Art and Sandy and I got to be friends in the 70s. Peter got to be my friend in 1960. Kathy in the 70s. Jim Wegman married into the Kendrigan family. And, and so it was just, you know, some friends getting together on a Sunday afternoon. Yeah, it is, with a focus on our discussion. Yeah. Did, were there, I, one of the questions that I would like to ask has to deal with sort of the content of the class, and if there were particular lectures or readings that stood out to you. Um, Two stood out to me the most, and I, I did not prepare for this interview at all, so this is just my impressions remembering. Um, I think I told you before that the one that impacted me a lot was that second one with all of the paintings because it was something I knew absolutely nothing about. And the, the glorification of the fallen soldier and trying to salvage something of dignity out of World War I. And then you get to how that fed into the awful part as the Nazis rose about we was robbed <laughs> is basically what I'm thinking. And, you know, I felt it myself when I went to Normandy. Two months after our course, I, I went off to, to Europe and we were in Saint Malo and it was pretty easy just to go up to Normandy. And I felt very strongly and thought, I'm not sure Professor Rossi would approve of this. <laughs> the, the monuments worked. Like they worked. They, 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 evoked, they evoked emotion. <laughs> Ooh. They, uh, oh, yeah. That they're designed to do. Mm -hmm. that. So that was, and again, the art of that time is something I didn't know anything about. And Professor Rossi was very, I thought he was very, very strong on art. He knew his art. Um, the other part that just appalled me was when he was going through the literature, the popular literature that plowed and replowed and replowed that ground of anti-Semitism and how deep it went. And I, I mean, I, I know I went, I wrote a long thing about Christian anti-Semitism because it's something I'm distressingly familiar with. Um, but his part about, I didn't know about those novels. And of course it made me think about the myths that circulate in our culture. And um, they're out there. Uh, I, I, I don't read right-wing news sites. I think it, a lot of it shifted into social media now. But so many of the stereotypes are in popular literature that intellectuals don't think about. There was this terrible book, and we all loved it because it was, had sex in it. Um, Mandingo, do you remember that? You wouldn't, you're too young. You <laughs> yeah. But, but perpetuating the, the myth of the hyper-sexy black people. Um, there was Frank Yerby, who I heard was a black man, who wrote novels perpetuating those same myths. And you don't even realize it, because they're you know, so much fun um, to read at the time. Gone with the Wind. Mm -hmm. Go the lost Cause. Uh, yeah, The Lost Cause Theory, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, we have, we have our own literature of that, but I hadn't, I hadn't known any of that. Um, and you know, we, we kept debating back and forth in, in our group, well, how much of this was cultural and how much of it was economic. That's a well-known histor historiographical debate, but, but it's one that, that we still have today. Look at, look at the Trump factor. We're still fighting about why it is he won, and we'll never resolve the issue.
Well, anyway. Well, I, you know, one of the, the main thing that I always hope that people get out of these online classes is just the, the, the ability to identify the myths that mm -hmm. surround them and the way that they're being and how they operate. Right. Yes. Yeah, how do you build it? How do you mobilize it? Is if you're just a little reflective, that's, that's a very powerful tool to have in mm -hmm. the political sphere. It's just mm -hmm. think a little bit about that meme from Russia that pops up on your social media page. Yeah. What are they trying to get you to do here? What are they trying to get me excited about? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, so my, my final question, and then we'll just open it up a little more, was did your understanding of racism and anti-Semitism change after the course? It deepened. Okay. It made me, again, less optimistic that that it's easily fought. And of course, this is all happening in the context of Donald Trump has been elected president mm -hmm. and watching him. I mean, whatever you think of the man, I was Peter and I were talking, he's not a moron. He is a media genius. And he knows where the hot spots are, and he knows how to push people's buttons to encourage racism and divisiveness. He's been doing it all of his life. And so I'm I'm studying the the Mossy material at the same time, in real time. I'm watching what's happening and all my lefty friends are making fun of him and watching the comedy shows making fun of him and I'm thinking, folks, this is working. Yeah. Watch what's happening. You're not stopping his agenda. He's changed immigration in this country. I mean, as awful as it is and there's some small victories, um, some injunctions, some, you know, people, a few people getting liberated from their little cages, but by and large, he's won. Um, and we're going to go back to an immigration policy that we haven't had since 1924. Um, and that's, that's happening as I'm reading all of this and thinking, you know, this stuff works. We, we have to think of, of ways to counter it, and I'm not sure I've thought of a way. I mean, here, here in Milwaukee, we're trying to improve turnout in the neighborhoods that don't turn out. I mean, arguing with a Trump supporter or a Hillary hater is an exercise in futility. But getting back to the course, um, I'm studying the course at the same time I'm dealing in real time, and my pessimism has deepened. The effect of the, effect of the course, particularly working um, in a political arena in real time, I think has deepened my understanding of how very, very powerful um, tribalism is. I don't just want to say racism, it's tribalism. Because it's not just hatred of a different race. That doesn't do it. Everybody, that's why all these people walk around and say, I'm not a racist, but it's a sense of, you know, you get your own community together by defining it against the other. And that's, that's what I see happening. Um, it's, it's too easy to use terms like racism. It, it really is, and I fall into it too. But it's, it's the sense of you feel good when you feel like you've got your group and it's us against the world, and by damn, we're going to win this time. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the stoking of the resentments and it just laid out so perfectly in the course and by Professor Mossy, and he had lived it. But I think the real power of any course with Professor Mossy is if you know anything, you know this is a man who lived it, and his whole family lived it. Um, he didn't just study this from afar. That story about him getting out of Germany at 11.45 on the night before they closed the borders to Jews, whew! That was powerful. Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. John, did you have a couple? Or? Well, I just wanted to say thank you, of course, but what you said about satire not working resonates with uh, George's history because his family newspaper mm -hmm. tried to use satire right. and it, against Hitler, and of course, it didn't work at all. Even though Hitler hated the paper and, and sued closed the paper it, and tried it but mm -hmm. you know, making fun of someone like Trump, Trump 
doesn't work. It you know, it it's just a waste of energy. Really. Well, and it just agitates and confirms his enemies. And I understand we we need shows like Colbert and Trevor Noah to keep our own spirits up. But the idea that in our talking to each other in our bubble and making um, acerbic fun of Jeff Sessions, Trump, Lindsey Graham, any of them, it, it doesn't change anything. It just makes you feel better. Right. Exactly. It's, it's a waste of energy and it's very satisfying, but mm -hmm. it's like eating cotton candy. It doesn't really do any do you any good. But, well, but you got to have your cotton candy fix every now and then. Yeah, okay. Absolutely.